This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. You're listening to an encore presentation on MPB Think Radio. We're not able to take your call right now, but you can always reach us through email. The address is garden at mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Think Radio. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and we are talking about gardening. And it's been a while, too. It's been a couple of weeks, as a matter of fact. Java, uh, we took a little break last week to, to get some things set up around the office. How you doing, man? Oh, man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Glad to be um, here with you on this Friday morning, you know, getting this garden party started. And in air conditioning, too, right? <laughs> now, ain't that the truth? I got to put the Mississippi on it. Ain't that the truth? Yeah, man. You know, a lot of people, we've always heard about the dog days. And the dog days really get a funny name. It's because of the, the star called Sirius, which is the dog star. It's the highest in the sky. But it just coincides in our part of the world with it being the hottest, most miserable part of the summer. So uh, at least in Mississippi, that's absolutely true. As a matter of fact, I came across a proverb from farmers from back about 100 years ago, North American farmers, that a dry growing season through the dog days was preferable to a wet one. As a matter of fact, here's a proverb. Dog days bright and clear indicate a good year, but when accompanied by rain, we hope for better times in vain. I know Mississippi's got its fair share of, of uh, rainfall this summer. So um, those of you who don't like to water, <laughs> you looked up this year. So anyway, for the next hour, we're just going to be talking about gardening. I know it's hot. I know it's humid. I know the rain comes and goes. With, and one thing for sure is the weeds are growing just about better than anything. I'm getting a lot of emails these days and, and calls and notes on the Mississippi Gardening Facebook page about insects like army worms, a lot of fungal diseases, leaf spot diseases, tomatoes cracking, all that kind of stuff. And if there's some things you'd like to talk about this time of year, bring it on. That's what I'm here for. And it's toll free, one eight seven seven mpb ring um, That's one of the things that MPB does is it brings local produced programs on a wide variety of topics uh, by local people. Uh, to you, and right now it's all about gardening. So, I want to give us a call, Java. Well, let me know when we got some folks on the line. Yeah, we're getting some uh, getting some calls lined up now, but I think it's a good time for you to make us all envious and tell us the temperature um, where you are right now. <laughs> well, you you might you might not really want to know that because uh, today, in just a little while, of course, you got to keep in mind I'm I'm in England. It's three o'clock in the afternoon here, and it's about I think to bump up to fifty eight. I think it's it's over at fifty seven, and it's going to get down uh, tonight to about fifty degrees. So. Anyway, it's, it sounds interesting, but keep in mind that they can't grow tomatoes outside. They can't grow okra. They can't grow sweet potatoes because there's not enough warmth. A lot of people forget that England is on the same latitude as Nova Scotia. And so the days are long, uh, but they're also chilly. And at night it gets chilly, too. And tomatoes just won't ripen. They won't turn red. So everybody's got these little backyard, unheated little lean-to type greenhouse just to grow a few tomatoes. And we're complaining about ours cracking open and making too many. So anyway, um, you know, I'm not going to really talk that much about the differences between uh, gardening in different parts of the world because Japan, England, Africa, South America, I've been all over the world. And we have a lot of stuff in common, a lot of plants in common. Uh, right now, one of the hottest plants growing in England is one of the most durable summer plants in, in the United States and Mississippi is an old-fashioned uh, type of it's a hibiscus. It's a hibiscus shrub, almost a small tree. Um, and Latin name is hibiscus syriacus. You know it as either Rose of Sharon or as um, Althea, Althea Rose of Sharon. It will bloom in Canada. It will not freeze even in Canada. But right now in the dog days of, of Mississippi summers, there are so many really cool Rose of Sharon or Althea plants out there. 
that I've worked with a fellow up in Flora, just north of Jackson, who's been collecting different kinds, pink ones and red ones and whites and some with, with different eyes. And he's got some blue ones and some doubles and singles, all different kinds of Althea's. And he's rooting some right now. And we're thinking about getting a collection of them going in the cemetery in Jackson, the old Greenwood Cemetery where the roses are, so people can come by and see what will bloom in the middle of the summer with no care at all, and then you can take cuttings because Althea's root in water from cuttings taken right now. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff going on. We're trying to preserve the past and, and give people more variety in their gardens of what will grow well in our climate. Forget England and Japan and South America. What grows in Mississippi? And well, that's what I'm always interested in. Well, let's let's keep it keep it in Mississippi, but let's go to the um, coast and speak to Lois in Long Beach. She wants to join the show this morning. Hey, Lois, good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I have a situation up? down here that I am confused about because I have the impression that gladiolas are the color they're going to be no matter where you plant them. <laughs> well, sort of, pretty much. Okay, so last fall, a friend gave me a whole bag full of gladiola bulbs, and I did not plant them right away. I planted them in the spring. I planted half in the backyard and half in the front. Now, the backyard's to the east, the front yard's to the west. Now, this was totally random. However, for some reason, all the ones in the back are white, and all the ones in the front are red. <laughs> now, is this possible? I mean, well, it, well uh, I'm uh, so blown you, away. Uh, unless you're somebody's got you trying to punk me in Java about it, you know we have to. Uh-uh. You know, but you just you just reach in the bag and pull some out of the bag and put some in the front and some in the back, and they're different colors. Yes. You know, this is something that's, that's come up for, for decades. You know, some people say, I planted yellow irises, and now they're all blue. And the iris experts say it's not possible. Horticulture say it's not possible. But it happens too many times to to just to gardeners. Uh, yeah. I don't have an explanation for it, but um, as a matter of fact, I'm stumped. I love it. After all these years, I love getting stumped. What I'm doing, though, is I'm making a note um, – of this, I'm gonna do a little bit of research. I've never heard of it before, uh, but okay. I've heard it with irises. I've heard it with other plants, and and from my training point of view, it can't happen. But there it is. Yeah, I'm gonna argue. See, that's what but I thought because you know, you know, we know that when you have oh, yeah. um, I, yeah, well, see, uh, one of the some plants, other, uh, if you experts, put different yeah, soil well, or whatever, plant. they'll change color. Yeah, but well, you know, with I've never heard of this, and it's yeah, still. But, I have another one in the front. It's red. Well, you're talking about hydrangeas? And the back, all were white. Uh, totally yeah. random by me, totally random. Well, but Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to see what I come up with and stay tuned for next week. You know, I, I know that, that some plants like hydrangeas, whether there's aluminum in the soil and stuff like that can affect their colors. I've never heard of it with gladiola, so I'm stumped. I love it. I love getting stumped. So stay, stay tuned next week. Let's see what we can come up with. Awesome. I appreciate it so much, and take care. I'm still picking okay. cherry tomatoes off my sweet 100. <laughs> okay. Oh, and by the way, in the middle of October, I'm going to be doing a program at the Past Christian Library. That's just right up the street, so I hope to see you then. Maybe, maybe I'll, we'll have I'll try. I'll try to make it, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. Oh, boy. You know, Starting to show off I, uh, with the uh, with the, with the real head scratcher this morning, Felder. I don't mind at all. You know, I studied plant physiology, and, you know, after all these decades, I've seen and heard a lot of stuff that does not make sense to me at all. But I ain't going to call somebody a liar when they say, here's what happened to me. So we'll just scratch your head and see what we can come up with. I like so, that. Now, Felder, I, we, we, uh, getting ready for our first break this morning, but I have to ask this question for some of the um, flowers that are, Growing around my house, <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, the ones y'all had pulled up to use for the pots for something else. Well, maybe we should have. Uh, well, I will say that our basil, oregano, um, uh, planting slash experiment had to come to an end because um, my wife Crystal got some indoor plants and needed the pots. But, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but this is what I wanted to ask you about with the indoor plants. I guess my thing is knowing 
how much light they need to get because they're kind of focused toward the win- one of our big open windows, yeah. but you don't want to, you know, zap them too much, and then a couple of the leaves are turning yellow, and we just, yeah. you know, we're not just trying to, I guess, get some general advice on that. Yeah, and this happens to me too, Java. I've got indoor plants that, you know, if you if you turn, when a leaf is formed, whatever those conditions are, that's what that leaf is used to. And if it changes the condition, if you take it outside or bring it inside, or if you turn the plant around, those lights don't, uh, those, those leaves don't work as well anymore, and they'll slowly just either burn or fall off or turn yellow while the plant puts on new leaves for the new spot. So in general, find a spot that you like to plant in and just leave it, let the older leaves do their thing and try to get new leaves to come on that like the new spot. And you that's know, exactly just, what she said this morning. She mentioned this morning, she said they must be doing something right because they're putting on new leaves. But like you say, at the same time, the uh, some of the other leaves are turning uh, yellow and kind of falling down. It's sort of like when we go out and get sunburned, that old, that old stuff peels off and got nice new stuff underneath. So uh, that that's the main thing is uh, wh- one of the things to do is make sure you're not keeping it too wet by watering it all the time or letting it stay dry. So uh, whoever's watering it, you know, as soon as you water it really good, sort of lift the pot up and kind of feel what it feels like when it's full. And before we water it again next time, lift it up and it still feels a little bit heavy, leave it alone, but it's starting to feel real light. So you can just go by the how, how it feels, whether it needs water or not. But that's the main thing. And, and of course, different plants, some plants like really bright light. Some plants don't like a lot of bright light. So some of it depends on what kind of plant you got. Uh, shoot me a picture of it, and we'll take it from there, man. I will do it. And one one more question before we um, go to this break. Um, a neem oil. I don't, I don't, she, she, like, I don't know, bought some gallons of it. <laughs> well, what yeah, is, yeah. What, what's, what's the deal with the neem oil? <laughs> It's it's uh, it's an oil made from a tree called neem, and it's one of those miracle things that kills insects, it prevents diseases, you know, it won't grow hair on the top of my head, but it's one of those kind of all-purpose miracle type of things that sort of works in some situations, but... Um, you know, anytime people come up with, with a, a miracle product, I'm always suspicious of it. Basically, it's used as an insecticide or a fungicide, and that's about it. Okay, okay. So, like you said, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah that, that's right, that's right. And uh, there's a lot of information about these kind of things. People have home remedies, they have natural controls. Uh, and there's a new development that I want to talk about uh, a little bit, not too much. Matter of fact, I'll just throw it out and get out of the way, but... It just came out that the Bayer Corporation, who bought out Monsanto, they own Roundup. They just announced that in 2023, two years, they're going to take Roundup off the market for home gardeners. Now, before you get your knickers in a knot, it was a management decision, a business decision. Uh, it's, it's about cutting their losses. It's not about whether it works or whether it's safe or not. It's strictly they're just tired of people asking about it. But um, anyway, Roundup is being taken off the market for home gardeners, which is just a drop in the bucket for what it's used for. So anyway, we can talk about that later. But meanwhile, we're going to take a quick break and come out with more that can stop gardening here on Mississippi Public Broadcasting right after this. Hi, Larry Morrissey with the Arts Commission, reminding you to tune in for the Arts Hour. We have in-depth conversations with Mississippi artists, writers, musicians, and other creatives. The Mississippi Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 on MPB Radio or download it as a podcast. All right, folks, welcome back. Horticulture is fell to rushing. And uh, before we take this next phone call, let me mention that uh, even though it's, it's, it's been raining a lot, sometimes we forget that birds and butterflies and bees, they need water. Not just mosquitoes need water. These other things, too. So if you have a bird bath in your, in your garden or if you want to make one or just turn the top of a plastic trash can upside down and put it out where the cat get, can't get to it, uh, it'll really help a lot of the wildlife out there. Uh, and if you're worried about mosquitoes, just every three or four days, just dump it out, throw it on your, uh, on your, your shrubs and fill it back up with clear water. But wildlife this time of year really, really needs uh, the water because it's, it's tough for them. You know, they can't just go back in and, and, you know, sip on some iced tea if they need to. So think about a bird bath, anything that holds water that's fairly shallow. Uh, and if you put a pile of gravel in the middle of it so that gravel sticks up out of it like a little volcano, you'll have bees and butterflies landing on the gravel because they can't flop around the water. 
So a bird bath with anything that, that bees and butterflies can perch on really does help a whole lot. And don't worry about the mosquitoes. Just throw that stuff on your shrubs. Now, let's slide down to Tyler Town and talk with Beverly. Good morning, Beverly. Thank you for holding. Hello, Beverly. Are we, are we I think, here? I think, Beverly's, I think Beverly's waiting for um, her name to be called over the radio. Okay, yeah, we got a little delay in case I say phytochrome. Oops, I said phytochrome, didn't I? <laughs> you got me thinking about science, Java, when you're talking about the leaves and the plants. You know, if you put a, a, a plant in the window in the shade or something, like, notice how it leans towards the light. There's actually a reason for that. The same reason why some plants, what, what makes their flowers open in the daytime or at night, plants have light receptors called phytochromes. And when they get a certain type of light, red light, daylight, uh, it kicks them into growing phase. And in the evening, when there's no red light there, the far red light kicks in and it shuts it off so, so it kind of relaxes a little bit. So anyway, what makes plants lean towards light is the cells on the far side keep growing longer than the ones on the sunny side, and that longer cells on one side push the stem that way. Isn't that a stupid thing to know? Well, I know that sounds like a uh, a science experiment as we are right on the top of uh, the brand-new school year. So, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. And there's some really cool things that get done with that, too. So, uh, man, I, I, I was a judge at science fairs for so long. And uh, there's some really cool stuff, really cool stuff out there that have to do with why do plants, why do flowers open, and can you make them open and close out of season, which is what horticulturists do. You know, they add extra lights uh, in the wintertime to make plants bloom early, like uh, Easter lilies won't bloom until they get longer days, so they'll give them longer light at night to trick them. And poinsettias, they'll cover them up late in the afternoon and make them think nighttime is longer than others to get them bloom earlier. So, you know... Uh, horticultures manipulate uh, things like that. Let's but see anyway. if Beverly um, Beverly is with us. Beverly, are you there from Tyler Town? I am. Hey, good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. And yourself? So far, so good. I'm cheerful anyway. That's a good thing to be. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's I, going I, on? I have a problem I, with chinch bugs, and they just keep going in my lawn. What can I do? Uh, well, you, you must have St. Augustine or centipede grass, I guess. Uh, St. Augustine, mostly. Yeah. Uh, chinch bugs, they're, they're tiny little members of the stink bug family. And it, to, it, to be honest, they're hard to find. I, I see all sorts of tricks, but, you know, they, they fold their legs up and drop to the ground, but even if you pass a shadow over there. But what chinch bugs do is they're, they're stink bugs, just like what the bigger ones that get on the tomatoes, is they suck sap out of the plant. They inject a poison that can kill the plant. And what and you can spray uh, with a, a liquid insecticide, uh, not seven, but something that's labeled for, let's say, fire ant. Well, you'll probably find something that says for chinch bugs. But the trick is you need to not so much use a lot of poison, is use a lot of water, uh, mix, mix the insecticide in so that you get it down around the roots of the plants, and then come back a few days later and hit it a second time to catch any that might have hatched out from eggs. So, in other words, two sprays, more water than anything to get it down in there. And uh, okay. even if you kill them all, expect the grass to keep looking like it's dying a little bit longer because they've injected a toxin that causes the grass to turn yellow for a few more days. But other than that, okay. that's about all we can do. Raise your mower to, to, so your grass is as high as possible, and it'll recover as quick as possible. But that's pretty much it. Okay. Okay, good it. luck on it. And uh, by the way, Java, I have a lot of reports, uh, an alarming number of reports about army worms, which are a type of caterpillar, and they appear by the hundreds, dozens at a time. From uh, One moth can lay dozens of eggs, but these, these caterpillars get an inch, inch and a half, maybe two inches long, and they really do a lot of damage to corn and, and uh, agriculture crops, but also the lawn. Here's the good news is, by the time you see these army worms, and they're big enough for you to really notice them, they're pretty well done for the season. They pretty well have done all the stuff they're going to do. So if they're pretty good size when you see them, I wouldn't worry about them. Just hope that we, <laughs> I hate to say, hope it gets some rain, but throw a little fertilizer on your grass, and, uh, and it'll pretty quickly recover from the army worm attack. 
again, once the army worms are big enough to really start freaking you out, they pretty much have done all the damage they do, and I don't see, see the real reason to uh, to kill them when the birds and the spiders and the wasps will take care of what's out there. Just saying. All right, let's keep on with the uh, phones and uh, go to our cousins over in Alabama. Uh, let's go to Mobile and speak with Gene. Good morning, Gene. How are you doing? Hello, Gene. Hey, good. Gene. Put that some flour, sugar, butter. I'm making it. <laughs> they don't understand we have a delay. If you listen to the radio, you're 10 seconds behind us. Gene, just talk on the phone. Hello? Hey, Gene, what's going on, man? Hey, that's good. How about you? So far, so good. What, what I need to find out how to... Uh, plant a uh, hydrangea at this time of year, spring, fall, or when? Well, you know, you can plant, if a contain if a in a pot, you can plant it any time you can dig a good hole. It's a little bit harder to plant a, a shrub this time of year because it might need a little bit more water. And if you're not careful, you can overwater it, rot the roots. So uh, anytime you can dig a nice wide hole, and then when you pull it out of the pot, Kind of loosen up some of the potting soil and roots and stir it into your dirt. And uh, and then if you'll cover the ground up with mulch so the sun doesn't overheat it, the main thing is water it really good, but don't keep it wet, and it'll do fine. If it wilts, you can prune it back a little bit, but there's no problem planting stuff right now if you just don't overwater it. All right. It's, Sounds it's gonna like a good deal. You, it's going to be hard on you digging a hole in this kind of heat, man. Take it easy. Well, I'm going to wait till it gets dark before I go out there. <laughs> there you go. It, remember, you only get one shot at that hole, so dig it. If you don't feel a little stupid about it, it ain't wide enough. So dig a nice wide hole, add just a little stuff to it, but be sure to kind of loosen up some of the potting soil and roots when you set it out. And it should be. All right. I appreciate it. All right. Appreciate it, Gene. Thank, Thank you. Thank me. You know, we're here, there's a lot of stuff going on right now with summertime heat and all, and a lot of people are, are seeing trouble with their with their vegetables and some flowers with leaf spot diseases. Zinnias are getting leaf spots, and uh, some, some plants are getting powder and mildew. That's just because of all the rain we've had. If you've got a shrub that's looking really, really bad, you can prune it back right now. We've got plenty of time to prune a shrub, and it'll take the immediate stress off the plants, plus it'll get rid of a lot of the worst-looking stuff, and it'll stimulate some strong healthy new growth. It's okay to prune plants right now, but if it's a spring bloomer like an azalea or a blueberry, I'd go ahead and get on it and be done with it. But again, pruning a plant back is just going to stimulate some new growth. A lot of times it helps it bloom better. Now, Felder, I really, um, really am anxious to get to this cheesy tune because um, it's actually, and I don't think you knew this, but it's a, it's a, one of my favorite songs. Really? Yeah, Man, because you, it was... You ain't right. You no, well, ain't right. <laughs> well, not, I, I, I'll be completely honest. Not this version of the song, because um, um, as a tease, Quincy Jones did a, a version of this song, and then it was sampled in uh, by a number of hip-hop artists like The Far Side, Outkast, The Roots. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to throw this out to you. You come up with one as another version for next week. Okay. I want to hear this. Yeah, no, I mean, this, this is, is what this is when I was this I was raised on this one back in the '60s, I guess, maybe said I don't remember a long, long time ago. But yeah, come up with you know, uh, do a mashup of several if you want to, and let's have some fun with this because this is appropriate for the time of the year. Yeah, because okay, this is hot and hot and summer in the city. Oh yeah. Okay, folks, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Me and Java Chapman and other folks at MPB. Um, there's not a whole lot of plant sales going on right now, but last time I checked, the folks down at Crosby Arboretum in Picayune were having pop-up plant sales of terrific native plants that do great for your garden, attract butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, if you know of any garden events, let me know about them. I'll be glad to help promote them. But meanwhile, it's hunker down time. Get through the next couple of three weeks or a month or so, and um, time to start planting the last of your summer vegetables. Start time to think about planting stuff for the fall but meanwhile we're just going to take a little break we're going to wipe our brows a little bit take a drink of water and come back with more of the gestalt gardener here on mississippi public broadcasting right after this 
MPB Think Radio. Whatever your taste, news, music, storytelling, or how-to shows. Whatever your city, Natchez, Jackson, Tupelo, Cleveland. However you want. Radio, smart speaker, smartphone app. MPB Think Radio. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture still to rushing, and we're talking about gardening here on MPB. Uh, I just got a, a note from a listener uh, with an update on the Crosby Arboretum plant sale. It's a uh, flash sale. And they got summer perennials right now. These are the kind of plants that are native to Mississippi. They love it here. Uh, a lot of times they're outstanding for hummingbirds and butterflies and all sorts of pollinators and just downright pretty. They're not going to sell you a bunch of weeds. But anyway, it's from 9 o'clock until 11 o'clock. It's a two-hour show, free admission, Crosby Arboretum. Uh, you know, just just out from back behind the Walmart, basically, and in Picayune. So, uh, if you get a chance to get down there, I think it'll be a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Uh, let's slide up to Oxford now and talk with Anna. Good morning, Anna. How are you doing today? Hello, Anna. Hello. Howdy. You're on the air. What's up? Wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Turn your radio down, Anna, if you could. I have. Okay, just just, just talk on the, on the phone then. What's up? Uh, are you speaking to me, Felder? Yes, I am. Okay, well, this is Anna from Oxford. Yes. Okay. Um, you're very faint. That's why I asked. <laughs> okay. Um, I've got a problem with my boxwoods. Um, they're about 50 years old, and they're doing very well. And with all this rain, they're doing extremely well. And they're either side of my driveway. Unfortunately, my car... Is getting scratched every time I come up the driveway. Yeah. And I don't know when I should prune these. I mean, I obviously have to prune them because I can't ruin my car. Um, and uh, I guess the, all the rain we had in the spring has just made them you know, go whoop de woo. I mean, they just love it. Yeah. yeah. And um, when should I prune them? Well, here's the box was it. And Anna, and I, I had a Big boxwood. The only shrub in my front yard that I kept pruning to a tight meatball, just as a as a contrast to all the crazy stuff out there. Uh, boxwoods can be pruned as hard as you want. It just takes them a little bit longer than other shrubs to sprout back out. So if you prune them to just two feet tall, they'll sprout back out. It's just going to take a while. So as far back as you want to cut them, uh, it'll take anywhere from, oh, three or four weeks or so for new growth to come out. So we want to get this done before fall. So uh, it's not too late. I would say about the middle of August, next couple of three weeks is sort of the cutoff for hard pruning. And just cut them back further than you want them to grow back out to so that when the new growth does come out, you can slightly shear it to make it thicken up. So uh, anyway, you can prune them any time. I wouldn't prune any plants hard past uh, the middle of August or so so it has time for the new growth to toughen up before winter. And just expect boxwoods to take a little bit longer to come back out than it that's all. Uh, yeah, this is Anna Haller again. Um, I know he's talking to me, but I couldn't hear a thing on the telephone. Oh, well, are you talking on the telephone now? Sorry? Can you hear me? V- v- you're very faint. I don't know what the problem is. Well, I don't know. Let's just oh, say okay. it's not It's okay. not too late to prune them. How about that? What's uh, up, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure what's what's happening with uh with the you, with, with the delay you, going on yeah. this this morning. I don't know, I don't know, but anyway, if anybody else calls up, let us know if it's bothering y'all. But I I, I hear me and you and her fine. Yeah, I anyway. know. Yeah, I, and I believe uh, Anna was one of the guests when we went um when we went on our uh, Felder on the Road tour. She, that's uh, she right. That's live. right. Yeah, I wish you could have heard everything I said though, because here's the deal: boxwoods are notorious for having a wasp nest in them. <laughs> I wish I could have had her on, because if you're going to prune boxwoods this time of year, I would kick them first and make sure that there's not any kind of uh, wasp nest hiding in there, especially those little, they're not yellow jackets, they're called guinea wasps, and they will eat you up. So anyway, if you're going to be pruning this time of year, kick the plants first and watch for wasps coming out. I would also like to mention, this is a great time of year to root gardenias and altheas. Some people call them Rose of Sharon. Both gardenias and Rose of Sharon will root from cuttings, oh, five or six inches long 
with most of the leaves stripped off in water. They'll have roots within three weeks in water. So if you've got kids or grandkids or neighborhood kids uh, wanting to help them get into gardening, help them root a few things like this. And once it gets some roots on them, help them put them up in pots. And, heck, they might sell them to neighbors for a dollar a piece. We're trying to keep the green industry going here. So <laughs> Now that's something, Felder. Yeah. Oh, and, and by the way, I'm getting a lot of calls also about naked ladies in the yards. You know about those? No. What is going? This is all the way. This is daytime radio, Felder. I know. I know. There's the type of bulb uh, in the fall. There's these things that pop up all over people's yards. They're red flowers on stems with no leaves. Those are called uh, spider lilies. But this time of year, there's a relative uh, that come up about knee high, a little bit taller, and they got pink trumpet-looking flowers on. No leaves. The leaves come up in the winter time. But the plants just pop up in the middle of nowhere. This time of year, no leaves on them. Some people call them magic lilies or surprise lilies, but most people just call them naked ladies. Now, I said naked, not naked, okay? <laughs> yeah, there there is a difference. There is a difference. And uh, I can get into it if you want me to. Uh let's 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 stick to the plants. <laughs> okay. So um uh, Anyway, a lot of people, uh, the reason I want to mention this is because when they come up, whether it's the pink naked ladies or the red spider lilies, which would be in another month or, or two, uh, when the flowers come up, as um, soon as the flowers die down, that's when the bulbs are going to start growing their roots for next year for fall. So that's a good time to move. But when you see where they are, those are the ones to dig up. So either mark them. And, uh, and dig them as soon as the flowers fade or cut the flowers off and use them in a, a flower arrangement and dig the bulbs because that's the time of year not only to replant them, but also you know where they are. So if you want to move some when they bloom, best time to do it because you know where they are. That's the main thing right there. So we got any callers on the line or am I just talking in the thin, the thin air? Well, we're getting ready for uh, another break, but I was kind of curious because um, – you always, you know, kind of gone during the summertime. Have has anybody been by to check on your garden, or is it just you'll see what happens when it happens? Yeah, well, there, there, there's two two answer that one is uh, if anybody does come out of, to visit my garden, I will see you. <laughs> I've I've got some surprise, so don't feel like you can just go over and have your way with my yard because you can't. Um, but to answer your question, I've designed my garden over the years, over the decades, to pretty well take care of itself in the wintertime and in the summertime when gardening is not easy. I've designed it to look good in the summer and look good in the winter without me having to do a bunch. So I've chosen plants that don't really need a lot of a lot of care. Even my potted plants are the kind of plants that can go for weeks without any kind of rain, a lot of succulents and old-fashioned stuff. So it's pretty well designed to where if I weed it, in the spring and weed it in the fall and plant a few things in the fall and plant a few things in the spring. I'm pretty well done with it. Walk around with a, with a glass of iced tea in one hand. And that's about all I got to do. And uh, we have had some rain. The only thing I worry about is, you know, I've got that stuff planted in the back of my pickup truck. Even in, even it can go a month or more without any rain, but sometimes I might lose a flower or two over the summer and I have to replant when I get back in the fall. The, the idea is to choose plants that like the kind of weather we have. Yeah, now that's true. But let's um, let's go back to the phone lines. We have a um, caller from uh, Mobile. Let's uh, talk with Alan. Good morning, Alan. What's going on? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hey, good morning. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, uh, right here in Mobile, where do you recall any um uh, places that I can buy pendo palms from. Uh, the pendo palms, the jelly palm? Yeah, pen, yeah, that that are about three or four feet tall, you know. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's a good palm Mobile. for the coast. And, you know, pendo is also called jelly palm. I, I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't keep track of who sells what because, you know, there's so many different people, so many different type of garden centers. But, um, there, you know, there's a couple of, of places – uh, yeah, I tell you what, why don't you call the, either the Master Gardeners or call the folks at the Botanic Garden and ask them, you know, what's a, 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 a garden the, center that's like to carry a variety okay. of palms. All right. Be- because I, I just can't keep track of who sells what. Because it, But the Jelly Palm oh. or the Pendo Palm is good for the gu- – it won't grow, you know, like in Montgomery or anything, but it'll do fine on the coast. And uh, and and is uh, now still safe at, 
time to cut back the blueberries? Yeah, prune it's back? getting it's getting late. If you're going to prune blueberries hard, uh, it's really at the at the very end of the season. Uh, what I recommend is on blueberries, and this is what I do with my blueberries, the parts that are getting too tall to pick, as soon as I get to picking those, I cut them way back to about knee high. And then the stuff that's left, I just cut back this year's growth, you know, whatever grew since spring, about halfway, and then I'm done with it. And what's left will bush out, uh, and it still has time to set flower buds before fall. But, uh, we're, yeah, but I mean, pushing up the, the, the plants don't need to be over six feet tall, do they? Well, you know, unless you, unless you don't mind getting on a ladder to pick them, but you know, no, if, like I, I say, you I, can, I, you can I can't keep, get on the ladder to pick them. My wife won't get on the ladder to pick them, but she still expects them to to be a, yeah. as tall as a pine tree. So it's yeah. The, well, the way to handle <clears> that is the tall stuff. Just cut, cut this tall stuff back to about knee high or waist high, and you know, don't cut the whole plants back. Just the tallest stuff. In, in other words, every year thin out some of the tall stuff and whatever's left, cut it back a little bit, and that'll pretty well keep it compact. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Hey, good luck on the palm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, my bl- you know, there's so many plants that, that, uh, that people worry about pruning. Um, and there's a lot of debate about pruning some plants. It's just like plucking eyebrows. Some people do it. Some people don't do it. And if you like to prune or don't like to prune, it's a matter of personal taste. As long as you don't hurt the plant. And about the only way you can really hurt a plant pruning it is either pruning flowering plants just before the flower in other words, don't don't prune azaleas before spring, uh, or else pruning them so late in the summer the new growth doesn't have time to toughen up before winter. So, hard pruning middle of August is sort of the general cutoff date. Anyway, I'm horticulturist Felder Rushing. I'm sitting here looking at the website called it's a Facebook called Mississippi Gardening, Mississippi Gardening Facebook. Um, and there's people who ask about moving stuff, about what's this, how do I do this, do you want this kind of plant, uh, what you know, what's eating them up, whatever. It's an interesting thing of mostly garden variety gardens with a few experts sprinkled in. Uh, and I'm just looking at it, and people are showing pictures of their angel trumpet, their four o'clock, their night blooming cereus, so many fun plants that really you can't find at garden centers. You have to get them from people who got them from people. Uh, so I'd encourage folks to think about hosting a plant swap this fall or next spring to help get these plants out to more gardeners. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break and come back with more of the Gestalt Gardener Hill on MPB right after this. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology or tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. Okie dokie, welcome back to Horticulture's Bell to Rushing. Me and Java Chapman and other folks at MPB. You know, I mentioned about uh, moving the uh, the pink naked ladies right now. I mentioned about rooting Althea's or Rosa Sharon, rooting gardenias. Those are some good things to do. But a lot of people are concerned about leaf spots on their plants, especially hydrangeas and other big leaf plants. We've had so much rain that when you have a fungus that causes leaf spots, when a raindrop hits one of those spots, it splashes spores and like little marbles, and every one of those lands, if it stays wet, it's going to start more. So, yeah, we're having a more problem with leaf spot diseases this year. Take a good look, though. If your plant, if it's mostly the older leaves that are turning yellow or spotted, and there's healthy new growth on it, I really wouldn't worry about it that much. If it bothers you, snip it off. But in general, it's the older leaves that, were, that, that got rained on back in uh, April, May, and June, early July that had the worst of the leaf spots. If you need to, you can prune the plants back to get rid of the stuff and stimulate some strong, healthy new growth. If it doesn't rain very much, then it'll probably be okay without the leaf spots. But things like zinnias, there's no, you can't spray plants that are diseased to cure them. You have to spray before they get diseased. So if you've got spots on the zinnias, just take your glasses off. Put your old concrete chicken or a bird bath or something out there so you just notice the flowers and not worry too much about the leaves. So, how we doing, Java? Uh, we're doing fine, man. We're waiting on some uh, calls to help us end out the uh, end out the hour. But just want to remind people that if you missed any part of today's show, you can always listen by podcast or catch the rebroadcast on Saturday mornings at ten o'clock during our 
Uh, I think we branded it as our DIY block of shows because at 9, you have Fix It 101. At 10, you have the Gestalt Gardener. And then at 11, you have AutoCorrect. So Saturday wow. morning is pretty pretty jam-packed. And that pretty well covered everybody. Except you don't have a fishing one, I noticed. Oh well, we'll we'll <laughs> well creature creature comforts on Thursday. Um, it's it comes at uh, six in the morning. So when all the fishermen are and fisher ladies are, you know, going to the bait and tackle shop early in the morning, that's when they can catch that. There you go. There you go. Well, you know, there's plenty of stuff people can be doing in the garden right now. It is hot. You need to, to you know, if you're going to water your plants, try to do it in the morning. A lot of people are gardening late in the afternoon this time of, of year because it starts to get a little bit cooler then. If you're going to water, it's better to water in the morning than late in the afternoon. If you're going to water in the afternoon, try to do it with plenty of time before the so the leaves have time to dry before it gets dark. Because if you water right at dusk, those leaves stay wet longer and you're more likely to develop diseases on the foliage. It's okay. to It rains at night, but if you're a regular waterer, try to water regularly in the morning or at least late afternoon with time for the plants to dry before dark. That's just one of those those things. A lot of people are having uh, uh, trouble with stink bugs in their gardens uh, and they're spraying all sorts of stuff. Just keep in mind, folks, if you're spraying insecticides or fungicides on things you're going to eat, Read that label because some of them don't have a waiting period at all. You can spray and eat, you know, wash them off, of course. But some have a pretty long waiting period. So before you spray something, read the label. Make sure it's safe to use on that uh, vegetable and that you give it the, the right amount of waiting time or pick before you spray. In other words, just use some sense. Then let's slide up to Memphis, Tennessee and talk with David. Morning, David. How are you, sir? Hello, David. Go ahead, David. You're on the uh, line with Felder. Hello. How are you? This is David Pfizer. I'm originally from Mississippi, Cleveland. Yeah, and, uh, Delta boy. My question is, what do I do about these squirrels up here where I've moved to Memphis? <laughs> Everything I plant, they eat them up. Well, yeah, well, welcome to my world. I've got squirrels all over the place. I was raised uh, just down the road in Indianola. There's, there is not a good control for squirrels. I hear people talk about pepper flakes and, and uh, all sorts of, of gimmicky type of things that scare them away, but the truth is there's not a good control for squirrels. It, it never has been. You can catch them and release them, which is technically against the law, but more are just going to come. So um, I, I don't know what to say. I was raised in Pecan Grove, and we used 410 shots. Yeah, that's not practical in the garden. There's not a good control for squirrels other than netting or fencing. That, and that's just about it. Always has been a problem. That helps or not. Well, we appreciate you calling uh, this morning, David, and um, I think I've heard you say that once or twice before, uh, Felder, with the um, uh, the the four ten shotgun. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got you know, actually it's my great grandmother's for it. I think she spent either nine dollars or thirteen dollars for it or whatever. But she used to to we used to eat squirrels when I was a kid. We were hungry. You know, we're talking about hungry in the Delta, but. Um, you know, a lot of people wish we had controls for this and wish we could do that and wish we didn't have deer and and uh, and possums and squirrels and stink bugs and stuff. But the fact is, when you plant a garden, you're planting a big old target for all sorts of wildlife. Some of it's good. Some of it's not good. Some of it's good someplace and not others. The bottom line is, uh, you know, if you're not prepared to put a little fence around your garden and put some netting over your plants, you're going to have to deal with insects and, and critters. That's all it is to it. And uh, all these things people recommend that will that'll scare things off or, or uh, you know, deer repellents and mold controls and, you know, put fox urine and all these kind of things, they work for some people. Um, Irish Spring Soap. You put the blue kind or the green kind. <laughs> really? But I've, man, I hear it all the time, and people swear by it, but other people turn right around and it doesn't work for them. So I'm stuck in between a rock and a hard place. You well, know? Let's, so, um, let's, let's see if you can uh, <laughs> figure something out for Tom in Hattiesburg, who um, is probably going to be our last caller for the show, who wants to join the, join the show. I appreciate it, Java. What's up, Tom? Howdy. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Felder. Um, yeah, I've got some uh, camellia bushes and some hibiscus, native hibiscus, 
that um, have got the scale. I'm assuming it's the scale. It's it's that white stuff that's up under the leaves and stuff that's really hard to get off. And um, yeah. spraying it with oil spray, um, is it okay to spray it like three or four times a year? Because they seem to be just not, they seem to be coming back. Or... Yeah, well, if, if you're sure it's scale, the oil is going to be your best control. And the, the, the thing is, try to figure out when does the scale, when is it active? Does it do any good to spray when there's no scale there? Uh, so in general, we spray in the wintertime to smother overwintering scales. And you can spray in the late spring or early summer to catch any young ones that are, that are hatching out. But, you know, as far as just spraying routinely, we need to really find out what's, what scale is and when it's active and spray then. Uh, otherwise, you know, you not only risk, you know, using... Uh, and oil is, is a natural product. It's, it's organic. But if you're not careful, you can burn your plants if you spray it the wrong time of year. If it's about to freeze or really, really hot. I think most of the oils say not above 80 degrees. So that means uh, 2 in the morning is your only chance. But uh, let's find out for sure what the scale is. And, and, um, and in most cases, a real quick Google search will tell you when's the best time to apply uh, oil. But I'm going to say mid to late winter. And um, uh, er, late to early, I mean, late spring or early summer are going to be your two best bets. Really. Oh, okay. Well, just to follow up on some of the things I've asked before about the uh, pear, the bacteria, the wilt. Um, yeah. I cut every bit of it off of it and uh, cut down the two uh, uh, the Bradford pears because it was full of it in there and it didn't come back this year. So uh, yeah. good. Well, that's good. It's uh it, the the that particular disease the uh, fire blight spread by bees and if you don't have any trees that are infected with it within a quarter mile half a mile or so you're probably not going to have problems with it so I think you did well. All right and and uh, Mount Malabar spinach I got I, I got some seeds I was going to do it and they said to just save the berries because it you know even with the juice so I you know yeah. let them dry out so I'm trying to dry them out well they sprouted <laughs> so that yeah that didn't work. <laughs> Because trying a, to save for next year. <laughs> well, yeah, or go ahead and sprout them now because, I mean, it's it's a great plant. It's easy to grow. I love Malabar spinach. love the way it looks. I sort of like the way it tastes if you put enough baking grease in with it. I see. Well, you have a great day. I appreciate talking to you. Thank you, sir. I do appreciate that. And, uh, folks, John, I'm going to get off of this thing. I'm going to put some shoes and socks on. I'm going to wander across the moors. The raspberries, the blueberries, and the blackberries are in full fruit right now. And they are it. people over here used to walking everywhere. And everywhere you go, there's blackberries, raspberries, and blueberries. We ain't got that. And there's no poison ivy. There's no snakes. There's no red bugs. <laughs> and so, you know... I, I still I can't wait till I get back and hope that there's some figs left on my tree because you can't hardly grow figs and tomatoes out here. Anyway, well, I'm going to say shoot me a picture, Felder. I'll do that, man. I'll do it for the podcast. Uh, folks, we're going to take a week-long break and come back with more of the Gestalt Garden here on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Of course, it's rebroadcast at, at uh, 10 o'clock on Saturdays, and you can listen to it by podcast anytime by going to mpb.org, uh, mpbonline.org. Google Gestalt Garden, it'll take you right there. Hey, if you get a chance, take a kid to a farmer's market, show them, let them meet somebody who actually grows stuff and can share it with them and share them a little story. That's the kind of stuff where you create stories that'll last the rest of the life. Show a kid to do how to do what we do best, and that's get dirty. See y'all next week.